<laughs> but you go to you know the hills behind here, all that that are developing and covering up. Mm -hmm. That's really oh, some of the best soils in the world. That's one of them. Okay, and this one's super nice too because um, it's a it's not exactly like this one, but it's uh, it's a sandy loam. What that means is a, a, a soil has different sized particles. You probably know this. Sand, silt, and clay sized particles. And uh, sandier soils are bigger particles, which is sand, so they drain better. And clay soils, as you probably know, <coughs> they're so small, they hold water against the coarser gravity like a sponge. And silt kind of somewhere in between. And so a loam is approximately equal parts of sand and clay. And that's why it's good. That's why it's, oh, it's very good and loamy. Because it's good because there's different sized particles, that means there's different sized pores, that means that some of it drains, some of it retains water, and some of it drains slowly, and some retains, you know, very fast. And plants, they need water and air at their roots all the time. And that's why you want both well drained soil that holds water, which is probably basically the really reason you have to pause that. Well drained and holds water. <laughs> Right? Because if it drains, it means it's going deeper the water is. And then it gets sucked into all the micro little sponges, which are the tiny aggregates. So big holes are good, like worm holes and stuff like that. <coughs> also, when the water is moving down and it's draining, so let's imagine a raindrop entering a worm hole and then running down by the gravity. What's being pulled in behind it? <laughs> Air, oxygen. And I don't know if you know this, but in a single pinch of soil, a single pinch of soil has over a billion living organisms. Ninety-nine. That's not just a billion of one thing. It's tens of thousands of different species are in there, and ninety-nine point nine nine percent of which we don't even know who they are, what they're doing. Really, I mean, they're super hard to study because if you pull one out and try and raise it up on a little agar plate, it dies. Only about 0.01% of them will live on an argon plate. That's why we know about those ones, because they can live independently of their society. And they really are a complex, mutualistic, antagonistic, a lot of sharing of carbon energy and mineral nutrients and all that stuff. And it's a community. And so, I mean, and of course, you know, 50, 100 years ago, we just didn't know about any of that. And you know, even when we knew about it 20 years ago, we couldn't really study it because we didn't have the tools. Now we do. And so it's like the biological revolution that's happening right now for good or for evil. Um, and, and so that, if you can get nothing out of this talk, if you can get the idea that soil is habitat and four microbes, and really what you're doing is you're ranching microbes, and really what you're doing is you're managing space in the spaces. Pores that big, tiny, 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 tiny. So large pores, medium pores, small pores, tiny pores is really the goal. And the and the measure of that goal for effectiveness of your act, of your activities is how fast is the water going when you pour the water on. If it kind of pools up and starts to run off and starts carrying soil away, it's been over. Oh, you've, you've disturbed the soil too much. And of course, you're gardening, so you're disturbing soil. I mean, gardening and farming is about minimizing. You want something this big that has corn in it, you know, and that's pretty low diversity. But you should leave some of the weeds. You should do what you can. You know, you should minimize the disturbance to the extent you can. You know, and it's fun to till. You know, I love it. It's fun. I don't do too much anymore because I've been teaching for 19 years not to do that. But you have to till sometimes, and uh, I just don't have to go over it nine times. <laughs> And you don't have to do it on Saturday just because that's the day of convenience. Most people till on Saturday, whether it rains the night before or not, right? And so you want the soil to be the perfect moisture. And what's the perfect moisture for tillage is if you, it's a simple task, you just grab a clump of it, which is like a complex, self-organized habitat that's got air and water and millions of organisms and they've all worked it out and the roots have sculpted it and it's like perfect. And you squeeze it and shatter into little aggregates that have perfect habitat inside, <laughs> in there, right? And you break those apart, and they're still good. I mean, a macro aggregate, by the definition of soil science, is like that big. Wow. 
And as long as that's intact, you're good. And as long as those are stable, like if you can take one of those, put a little water in when they're dry, they don't fall apart, they can sit there. You know, they can get wet and dry. And they stay stable. And the reason they stay stable is because of organic matter accumulations that kind of glue it together. And dead root hairs <laughs> and living root hairs and, and fun, uh, fungi, little tiny filaments that are in there that are holding it together physically. So it's kind of glued together and physically held together. And all that just happens. Just, just happens. It's the laws of physics and thermodynamics <laughs> and the biology responding to that. And they, it, the soil becomes better habitat over time. That's why we're here. You know, when a root goes down, it goes down small and then it gets bigger. What does it do? It pushes the soil apart, which makes for a big hole. And then it branches out to being medium size. And then it's tiny and tiny and tiny. And so there is your, that's a pore, so that's a wide pore size distribution just by a plant growing in the soil with roots. So imagine this is the roots, a large part, small part, and tiny, tiny parts. And then it dies and it completely just decomposes. And it's gone. What does it leave behind? A casting of a large, medium, and small pores that are connected to the surface as a water and air are going. And that just happens. That's why there's a forest. You know, that's just the soil becomes sculpted over time by the organisms that live there. And the organism, I'm kind of just going, okay, is that all right? We're <laughs> red here, we're on it, right? And what the plants are made out of is carbon from the atmosphere. Plants, they don't breathe carbon dioxide, they eat the atmosphere. And the atmosphere, of course, we can't see it, so people don't believe in it, whatever. Okay, there it is. It's here, this carbon dioxide out here. And that carbon dioxide has to be taken apart because it's carbon dioxide, it's a gas. Taken apart and then put together into plant material. You know, you know, wood, roots, flowers, squash, all that is made from carbon that comes from the atmosphere. So plants have figured out a way to eat the atmosphere, take it apart, and put it together. And to do that, to take apart carbon dioxide and put it here into wood, <laughs> requires energy to do that. You gotta take it apart and put it together. And where does the energy come from, gardeners? The sun, right? 93 million miles away, there's a, 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 a giant nuclear reactor that's going to accept a tiny little sliver of that hits our planet, that energy. From 93 million miles away, it's UV radiation comes here, and plants have figured out a way to use that energy. And the way it happens is, if I remember this, is it, it knocks an electron into a higher orbital and drops down, creates ATP, and there's this molecule that it makes that is carbon to carbon bonds that has energy in it from the sun, is in the carbon to carbon bonds. And, and so when, it's, when the plant is, imagine a root getting bigger, the energy of the sun that's sculpting, right? The soil to be better habitat. And the plants that make the habitat better are the more likely ones to pass on that genetic information. And that happened. And the better, the, and then the more plants grow there because the, the better the habitat gets. And the better the habitat is, the more plants grow there. The more that's what soil building is. And that just happens in nature. It just happened, in, you know, over four billion years that happened. And uh, so, if you can just sort of get your head around that and sort of think about what you're doing in the garden, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to have that happen. So, minimizing disturbance is sort of the thing. No, the AI is. And so, um, so the, the, that, that, that those plants, what they are, the carbon gaps are energy from this. From, and remember how they, how they decompose completely away? That's what the bugs are doing in the soil. They squeeze out enzymes that dissolve the organic molecules, which release the nutrients, and then they suck them up, but a bunch of them get loose for the next generation of plants. And so that's what you're doing in the garden, is you're just trying to do that. So you're minimizing disturbance to the extent possible, unless you want a, a, a nice little slice of rainforest that has 
five different native plants in it and a giant supply of them, which would be pretty cool. Um, and you know, so you're just trying to whittle that down <laughs> to a bunch of plants that have symbiotic relationships and do make good root penetration, not over till it. Because so the first, imagine that beautiful casting, and then another one, another one, another one, another one, another one right? And it's all organized, and it's well organized, and all the organisms are right where they want to be. And then you till it, it, it destroys the big pores first. Like when you step on soil to compact, you're destroying this big pore. And so what you end up, and then it rains, and it all comes down, and then water doesn't go in. And then it's wet and cold. It stays cold longer when it's wet. And seed germination is all about temperature, as you know. The temperature at which seeds germinate, you can look that up, right? Like radishes and carrots and cilantro and beets and stuff like that, you can throw it right now, right? They're fine. But you know, tomatoes, it's gonna be 70 degrees or something, so you grow them indoors and transplant. But there's some, like beans, you don't put those out until May or you know, the end of May right, or something. Because the temperature, of the, it, it, it's about temperature. So having a well-drained soil that holds a lot of water, that's minimally disturbed, becomes better soil over time to grow more stuff to add more organic matter. So you can add organic matter by growing cover crop and leaving roots and then killing that and then feeding the soil. So there's a whole thing about cover crops and you probably know most of that stuff. Some of them suck up extra nitrogen that was left around from the previous season. Those are grasses. Some of them are like legumes that can take nitrogen out of the atmosphere using a bug that lives in, a, in its root and a nodule that can take nitrogen gas, tear it apart, turn it into plant food, feed the bean, adding nitrogen to that. And you cut it down to rots, it releases more nitrogen than it was there before. And there are other functions of, of cover crops. And there's a fantastic book on that. I should show it again. I won't show you the whole book. So are you saying weeds are good for the garden? Yeah, I mean, you know, as long as you don't let go seed, right? Huh. You know, as long as you don't need to pull up all the time. Right? Huh? You don't need to pull up all the time. Yeah, and actually, you really don't want to pull up anything that you tell them to. I mean, some weeds, they propagate underground right. rhizomes, like quack grass and stuff. We just dig that out eternally on man at the student farm. That's what we do on Sunday morning at Sunday school. <laughs> we dig out quack grass. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but let me show you this uh, just really quick. I promise I'm not going to get this. Um, this is called. So you can get it for 20 bucks, but you can just download it for free. <coughs> and here it is, and here's your, you know, here's your uh, hardiness zone. A lot of preliminary information, but I just wanted to show you just really quickly is this graph. This patient. Some crop, some there's something in your system where you could do that, probably. Or instead of tilling, just cover the whole thing with straw, right? And then open it up in the spring and transplant your big pumpkin plants into there. And, there. and if you do that too long, you end up with mice, so it becomes a problem. So whatever you do, just don't do it all the time and every time. Do different things all the time. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> 
So um, the other thing we gotta talk about, though, this is super important. Like, you gotta get a soil test. You really do. And it's really the only way you'll ever really know what's going on. You can kind of you intuit. You guys are great gardeners, I'm sure, and all that stuff. And you can kind of tell, you know, the color and how it feels and stuff. But you still gotta know because you might just be over applying some nutrients. Because you figure, well, better to have too much than that, not, not really. Too much is bad for, you know, it pollutes. You know, it gets into groundwater, it gets into surface water, it kills fish, and all that. <coughs> and if all of us gardeners are sort of doing a little of that, that's a lot. It's actually worse than probably these mega industrial farms. Because the mega industrial farms are being regulated. Hardcore, or you know, nobody's ready to you. But before I just do want to show you where the where that other farm is real quick, and then I'll talk about the most important thing in the world, which is clay. <laughs> um, so we're out here tonight, four thirty dark. Come on out, it's pretty awesome. How about, we've had seventy students out. On the Thursday nights until this is the first Thursday night of this year because it's been too dark. Uh, oh, it's just too many students. But we get so much done. I'm going to tell up my hand 900 book credits tonight and it will be done. And I'll put lime in and fertilizer and then Sunday morning I'm planting them all in broccoli because I have broccoli to do today. Yeah. Because, but it's, it's not going to be fun for me, but I have to pretend like it is. <laughs> so, and so our little thing is, here's the stadium right over here. So I'm going to kind of zoom in on that. So you see that's 35th right here. And this is Western, right? So you go out 35th to the West, I mean out to the Western and take a right out to that little place right there called Oak Creek Center for Urban Horticulture. We're out there Tuesdays and Wednesdays all day with my labs for this class. That's where our greenhouse is and everything. And there's actually three different soil types there. Uh, it's, I mean, really, it's a cool place to teach. It's Oak Creek. Is there a sign on? Yeah, on the right hand side here. On the, I guess, okay. on the east side. I don't know when it's not coming up, but here is the soil types. So we got Dayton and Amity, which are little clay ear, and then we got wood bourbon, which is really nice, but it's also a little silty. And then down here we've got something called Bashaw, which is super clay and cracks in the summer. It's right next to the creek because that's it over, that's where the flood happens every year, it used to, but they straightened out the creek and, and you know, it used to be, it'd be under a hip width right now. I'm sorry this isn't coming in, but anyway, uh, that's what it is, just so you know. Um, but we do have to talk about <clears throat> what soil is and how it works. And the main, so we've talked about the organic matter component of it and the living all that, the billions of single things and all that. What's really important though to understand is that what soil fundamentally is, is little mineral particles, right? Sand, salt, and clay. But all the nutrients that are in your body, every atom in your body was, was, it, was it has been through the soil system billions of times already. I mean, you just, this is a recycling. I would argue you are a soil right now. You are. You're a four dimensional complex habitat, a self organized natural body, a living thing that's processing carbon energy and nutrients. You're doing all that stuff. You're breathing in oxygen, exhaling CO2. I mean, that's what the soil does. It breathes in oxygen and exhales CO2. And, and the bugs are in you. I mean, God, all right, I hope you don't know this, but 80% but of your body by dry weight is not human, made from human DNA. It's like the bugs are in there everywhere. There are nematodes living there. Sockets, and there's some amoeba that live in your gum that come up clean your teeth and eye. And there's all the bugs that live in every hair follicle, and they come up and poop on your skin, and that's why you stink after a while. <laughs> <laughs> really, you are a giant habitat, a complex habitat. And, and, and soil, it, all those atoms, I mean, inside of us, as a giant secondary mineral in the shape of a skeleton that was made from calcium, right? And that calcium, originally all of them were in rocks. Every atom you will ever see and experience your entire life was either blown or mined from a rock. You know, that's it. It's, and there's 118 elements in the earth and the known uh, 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 
periodic table of elements, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a bunch of other ones that last a billionth of a second or whatever. But you know, 118, pretty stable. And that's what everything's made of, including you, including the soil, everything, including this rock. I have a rock in here. I didn't do it. <laughs> there it is, it's a little rock. And, ro and you can see they have like different colored crystals in them and stuff. A rock is just a collection of mineral elements, I mean, of minerals, which are made from crystallized elements, right? And the different colors of these crystals indicate different minerals, which have different elements. That and looks like a sedimentary rock. This is there a probably, difference this between sedimentary <laughs> or sure. igneous? They are, they're different in the, how they form, but they still are rocks that are made from minerals. But this is definitely an igneous rock, because those are actual crystals that form from cooled magma. This is almost like a piece of granite. <laughs> And the color of the rocks that the soil is formed from determine the fertility of the soil. So, and that's why there's different, there's 20,000 different named soils, right? And they're different because they're made from different rocks. So there's different rocks all over the place, right? And it's not an equal distribution of types of rock. So the geology determines the, 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 what kinds of soils can form from those rocks. And maybe you don't know this, but rocks dissolve in water. And you might not think of that because we don't live that long. <laughs> we just don't live long enough to really understand what's going on. And rocks dissolve really fast at the surface of the earth in geological time. Um, you know, Mary Peak always looks the same to every human that's ever seen that pretty much. Not that long. But Mary's Peak has been lifting, uplifting from the continental, the, the east one that Puka Plate is slipping under another continental plate, which is lifting the whole the east, the whole coast is being uplifted out of the ocean. And it's happening about the rate that your fingernails grow. But it's eroding away at the same rate. <laughs> so it's like a conveyor belt of mineral nutrients. And it's dissolving away, and that stuff goes down into the valleys, and that's why we farm in the valleys, and that's why we farm here, and that's why Corvallis is here. That's why Oregon State University is here, because it's good soil. That's why Salem is the capital, because that's where the good soil is. It's not in Crystal Valley, right? Because the value comes from the soil, the economics, it all comes from land and labor, and the rest is trade and theft. You know, <laughs> know the difference. I mean, a lot of accumulated wealth right now is not from labor or land, you know? And uh, so, I'm going to tell you the whole story, you know it. Um, but yeah, so the, if you don't believe me that rocks is all in water, just at lunch today when you're adding organic matter, there's a hole here and a hole there, right? <laughs> going through you, all those bugs are in you, and they're dissolving the organic matter, and it's going into your bloodstream to get pumped to every cell in your body, right? Via you the energy of the sun, you are an expression of sunlight energy, and you're just a big bag of wet rocks, and it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's almost over, and I don't need this talk. <laughs> Sodium chloride, table salt, put it on your hand, so lick it. And that is a mineral that is all really fast, instantaneously in geologic time. And then the next minerals, they drop a little slower and slower. And you get all the way out, and the, the one that's the least soluble part is quartz, which is silicon dioxide. And that's what sand is. And so when you dissolve, like right, I'll just do that one, right? Are you ready for this? Are you ready? Are you ready to watch this? Sooner or later, this thing is going to end up somewhere, or burn, and then it'll be salt, and then it'll get sweeped up, and <laughs> whatever, it's going to go up, and it's going to get into the soil at some point, and it's going to rain a little bit, it's going to go down, and it's going to dry, it's going to go down, eventually it's going to get to the water table. 
And I said, that's the outlet, and that's gonna be in the water table. And the water table's connected to the creek out here, which is connected to the bigger creek, which goes into the river, small river, which goes in the big river, which goes in the giant river, which goes in the ocean. That's why the oceans are salty. <laughs> really? And the next thing is the molybdenum, and the phosphorus, and the potassium, and the calcium, and all the other nutrients. They all end up in the ocean, and that's why they're sharks. <laughs> because the nutrients went out into the ocean. And that's where they come from. They come from the land. And, and you know, and then a phytoplankton uses some of that diffuse nutrient that's in the salt water in the ocean to build a little plant animal, right? Or a little fungi or something. Or, I mean, a, uh, like a, uh, some sort of algae or something. And then a little zooplankton eats that. And then a little fish eats the zooplankton. And then that bigger fiddler is a shark. Right? And that's it. So it bioaccumulates, and it takes a lot of time and a lot of animals to do that. And what soil is, is somewhere between all the nutrients being locked up in a rock and, and complete the solution in the ocean where we can't get them in the quantities we need to even eat. We can't drink salt water and get enough nutrients from it, right? So we have to eat the sharks, right? So soil is somewhere in between ocean and rocks. And, they, and it's being, and this is rotting up the way and it's falling apart. And the size of these crystals will eventually, they'll be released as little crystals in sand-sized particles and silk sized particles, and nutrients are being released. And the plants take up those, those solubilized nutrients at their roots. And they do that in the small pores where the water is, right? So there's a, in between every little piece of clay and silk is a tiny little ocean of water that has nutrients in it. And it's being, it's being held there and roots can go down and suck it up. And every, Cal every calcium atom in your skeleton was once dissolved out of rock taken up by a plant. And you either ate the plant or you ate an animal and ate the plant, or your mom did. And that's why you're here. And it won't be long. It's almost over. And I mean, and I do mean that stuff. <laughs> but, uh, and then you're going, man, just to normal. Everything back to normal. You mean atoms will go back into the melt and come up out of the volcano again? I mean, it's a long time. It's, four, it's another four billion years this planet is the stuff goes out. And whether we're here I think, you know, or not, it's going to happen. But everything's fine. I mean, mm -hmm. This planet has been hit by asteroids that killed 99% of all the life on the planet before. And yet here we are. So, you know, don't worry about it too much. <laughs> but do what you can. Minimize disturbance. That's, all. That's really what you got to do. That's the main thing. And think of it as a habitat. So, yeah. You get to my slides, I suppose. <laughs> but we had to go over that first. And oh, I tell you, sure. So forward to work. That's how I fund my interns. I have 200 interns funded through the sale of fruit and vegetables, we get no support from the university. For one, right there, bring it in home. <laughs> you did all the, all the dry chilies. What? Did you do all the dry chilies or did you do the market? I did the market. Yeah, super good. <laughs> Didn't alone. These people, like my new people, they aren't going to get along. They just have to do something to get it. So it's like it's on Saturday and Wednesday. So just kill it. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. I recognize you. Yeah. Um, I have a thing on in bulk. Anyway, um, so it's all about soil. Okay. And there's like 20,000 different named soils, right? And, you know, the this is a dry soil, so there's not a lot of nutrients being released. So it looks like that. You have to live like you gotta live like that if you want to live there. Right? <laughs> and this is a mollusol over here, which is the most important soil there is on the planet. It's an agricultural soil. You can grow anything in that. And so that's just two of the twelve soil orders. And I really want to kind of skip past this kind of I, I, well, not that, but skip past this just because and you know there's a map of the world soils. I'd love to tell you about how much time do we have. Like a half hour. Half hour more. Yeah. Okay. We we'll might get back to that. Because what's important here is that the United States has 21% of its land mass is in the good stuff. Worldwide, 7%. That's why we're here um, hanging out on a Thursday for fun. You know, driving here, 401ks, half of us retired. But, <laughs> I mean, because you know, they well, right? because there's this kind of soil. There's one other place in the world that has the same amount of mollusks. Mother Russia. I mean, that's what this is all about. I mean, they who have the good soil have the advanced technologies because they have the advanced agriculture. And the advanced technologies 
Uh, the ultimate specialization is designing intercontinental thermonuclear weapons. And so you can control the planet. And they're not controlling the planet here. I mean, they are because they have oil. But look at the, where the, this is where the you know, trouble spots in the world is, where the dry soils are. You know, here's the frozen soils up here. So this is what this war is about. That's what most wars are about. And what this is is really the map of political power. And I guarantee you that our, many of our political leaders would not recognize that. Because they have no business having it, in my opinion. Because this is the source of everything. You know, this is what it's all about. But what I want to get to is about clay. I'm going to play different soils, blah, blah, blah. Bottom line, <laughs> soils habitat. You got that? And you know, if you look at this little, this is a thing that's smaller than you can see. It's like a half a millimeter by half a millimeter. It's a little clump of soil. And look, here's a root coming down here that's pushing these rocks around from the energy of the sun and eating the atmosphere and getting bigger. That's what happened here. This used to be a root here. And now it's gone. Look what it did. It made a big, it pushed these rocks apart, so now it drains there. But when it drains, it aerates these little oceans. Look at this little, this little ocean in here. It has a sea, sea serpent living in here. <laughs> That's eating those things. That drinks the poop of those things. And this thing is waiting for this to die, so those things can eat that, because they do it together, whatever. <laughs> and these three pieces of sand are from three different sources of minerals, and they're dissolving mineral nutrients into that ocean. And there's an ecosystem going on between three pieces of sand. That's completely different than this one. Because this one, this thing is up here, look, it's got to be in a big pore, because it's air, it breathes oxygen. And so there's got to have a big pore for this thing, which is scraping algae out or something, and it's pooping here, and this is being fertilizing this little ocean here. Which is completely different than there, which is a fungal mycelium, and this, this root is pumping out sugar water. And that's just like a half a millimeter wide. It's down here, it's like bacteria that reproduce, reproduce every 21 minutes, and they're completely probably uniquely adapted to this habitat in the entire cosmos. Possibly. Yeah. yeah. That's, I mean, that's what soil is. Soil's a living thing, right? It's a living thing. It's not a chemical sponge. Right? And, and that's a, a real different way, and that's a real different way of thinking about things. In the 20th century, it was about chemistry. And we got good at it. And the early 20th century and late 19th century is about physics. And it's about physics, that we get it. chemistry, and all biology is a really complex chemistry, right? And, um, but it's complex and super hard to study, and that's why people didn't know about it. That's why we did things the way we did, so we destroyed the planet, you know? But it doesn't mean it's over. It's all, it is for us, but, you know, <laughs> it won't be long now to do this. Uh, but I mean, you know, I teach these kids, and they're like, they know all the bad news. And the thing is, is they, this is like, what, with this being normal? And, and they know what's going on. And hopefully they can get control of the political environment and actually do something about it. Because we know what to do. We know what not to do, mostly. Or just leave it alone. Is really is an, an ad-organic thing. That's the answer. You want to know what the answer is? Doesn't matter what the question is. The answer is ad organic. What's the answer? Ad organic. <laughs> oh, but when you add organic matter, what you're doing is you're adding carbon from the atmosphere and energy from the sun, which is food for the billions in a single pinch. Right? And um, let's see. So talked about soil being rotted rock and decomposed organic matter. I want to talk about a little more about rocks. And you know, soil is about half space. And if it's small pores, half, you know, it doesn't say anything about size, just half of it is space. Small pores hold water against the force of gravity, large pores hold drain in the force of gravity. This is like an ideal situation where the space is spread out such that half of it drains and half of it holds water. Right? Where you compact soil, more water storage, less air, less drainage. Right? A sandier soil has more air less water storage, right? And so, um, and then there's this minerals, and then this little bit of organic matter. And 5% organic matter in a soil test is a lot. And it's not the sticks and the leaves and all that stuff. It's like the rendered down leftover black goop that glues the stuff together that makes stable aggregates so they don't fall apart when they get wet. And so you should get a soil test, and you should find out where your percent organic matter is, because this number right here that organic matter, it rots away, it mineralizes, is the term, which is kind of a 19th century term because it doesn't really mineralize. 
control, but it's mineralizing, meaning it's releasing the nitrogen in a plant available form. And about one to two percent of the total tons of organic matter in your soil will really be mineralized into nitrate, which is plant food. So the higher this number is, the more nitrogen is being released just from the soil for doing nothing. And if you have 5% organic matter and a very robust, if you care for the soil so that it's got a lot of oxygen, it's, you've really worked on it for a few years to get it to be a biologically robust sort of soil, then like 5% you can get like 100 to 150 pounds of nitrogen just coming out of the soil every year. And as long as you keep that number around five, because remember it's only one percent of that total. Like it could be thirty-five thousand pounds of nitrogen, total nitrogen in your soil, and one percent of that is going to be mineralized every year. But if you have fifty thousand pounds of it per acre, it's going to be that much more. And then you have to buy a fertilizer, right? Because you're building the soil. Because that's how it works. That's that's why we're here. If, if there wasn't fertilizer, you know, eighty-five years ago. You know, um, so, I mean, commercial fertilizers. And so if you got like 2%, you should work on it to get it up to 5 And that means adding, or, or adding some compost every year, not a jillion pounds of it, just put it on every year, grow some cover crops, leave residues, try and minimize disturbance, this number's going to go up. And then you'll need to use less for fertilizer. Um, but this is the part, the sand, salt, and clay, right? And the sand, salt, and clay, Here's a rock, we zoom in on it, right? These are the different crystals in here. And this dissolves, these, these crystals dissolve out at different rates. The black ones actually are, are the ones that, the darker the soil, the rock is, the more mineral nutrients that are important for biological uh, life. Mm -hmm. So basalt, like we have around here, is mostly dark stuff mm -hmm. and small crystals. And so it rapidly dissolves out, and that's why you're here. That's why you live in Corvallis, right? Because it's nice soil. At Corvallis is the furthest south you could go by steamship uh, for students to go to Oregon State University. So they used to come down to the waterfront, get off the steamship, horses and buggies, take them up to Community Hall, formerly known as Benton Hall, right? And that was the school. And then the farms went to the west. <coughs> what happened to all the farms? They're covered with buildings now, right? Those are the good, that's the land, that's the good soil. That's why it's here. Um, but if we could shrink ourselves down to the size of like you know, normal life, meaning bacteria and fungi, you know, a piece of sand would be the size of this whole complex, right? But for sake of easier, we just imagine this is a, a piece of sand, two millimeters, right? And all the sand is is a ground down piece of rock. It's all down, falling out of a rock. It came out of a, a rock as a mineral. Mostly it's quartz. And that's why it's on the beach. So the stuff that ends up on the beach, the rest of the dissolved stuff's out in the ocean. So you go to the ocean, taste the salts, pick up the skeletons. Those are ancient mountain ranges that are being moved around. But sand is just a rock, and 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 silt is just a rock, it's just smaller. It's 0 .05, 0 .00, 0 0.05 millimeters, not 0 0.002 millimeters by the USDA. Um, but clay is a different thing. It's not just a rock. It's not just a ground down piece of rock. What it is is rocks dissolve and, the, and certain elements tend to come back together as crystals at the surface of the earth. And those crystals can only get that big because they can't get any bigger without breaking. Because they're not made in the hearth of the earth, high pressure, high temperature. They're made from things dissolving and recrystallizing. Kind of like salt dissolves and recrystallizes, but it isn't salt. And actually it's 50 times smaller than the smallest pixel on the screen relative to these sizes. So it's really small, 0 0.002 millimeters or smaller is a clay size of earth. And clay forms when rocks dissolve and recrystallize at normal surface temperatures like this and normal surface pressures like this, which is really different than how rocks form, right? And they can only get certain, up, it's a crystal, so you gotta kinda think crystals. Imagine a sheet, crystalline sheet, thin, right? Growing at the edges and getting bigger because there's liquid, the solutes are there and it's kind of growing. Imagine that crystal growing, gets about to 0 0.002 milk and then it breaks. And then it grows again and then it breaks, right? And it can't get any bigger. Also these sheets, they sort of stack up on each other. And so they stack up 
And how high can these sheets stack up about that height before they fall over? Like if you stack books, they can only go so high before they fall over. Right? So that's really different than just a, a sphere of rock or a small sphere of rock. This is a thing that has giant surface area, all those layers, and it's really small. So it and it's not a sphere, it's like a jagged crystal. So like if you took a thimble full of sand and measured all the surface area on the other particle of sand and laid it out, it'd be about the size of a sheet of paper. Like that, an eight by 10 piece of paper. That'd be the surface area. You take a thimble full of, of, of silt and you measure it all out, the surface area would be about a yard, maybe a large newspaper opened up, right, both sides. You take a thimble full of clay, it's the surface area of a football field. In a, in a thimble hole. <clears throat> so it's just a giant surface area, but it's really small. All right. <laughs> it's going to have to work out one hour or a glass of wine. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's just like, what? I get it. But think of this. But imagine if this was just a piece of rock shaped like this. And I measured that surface, that surface, that surface, that six surfaces. I measure that, it would be pretty low surface area. Even if it was this shape. But imagine if I could measure all those surfaces too. Right? Okay. That's super important to understand. <coughs> so clay is a secondary mineral, a primary mineral that forms at normal surface temperatures and normal surface pressures as a product of dissolution and recrystallization. Okay. Alright, so rocks dissolve in water, the liquid dissolves out of them. nutrients. And the some of the, the four most abundant elements in the Earth's crust are oxygen, iron, aluminum, and silicon. And as it turns out, those four things bond to make the secondary mineral that is a sheets of silicon aluminum oxide. It's an oxide. Clay is an oxide. But still, remember, look at the shape, right? Think of that. The, the way we kind of think of this, right? You're thinking of that shape. Really small. 0 0.002 millimeters or smaller. Okay, so <coughs> here we're going in, okay? We're going in as far as we can go here. <laughs> beyond, this, beyond this slide is unknown. Okay, not quite, but pretty close. Silica dissolves out of a rock, so does oxygen. Aluminum dissolves in a rock, and they form, the silica has a certain size and a certain charge to have covalent bonds with oxygen to make a silica tetrahedron. It just works out that way. Uh, oxygen has a, I mean, aluminum has a certain size and a certain charge that it forms bonds with these six oxygens, in this case, hydroxyl groups, but still, to make a, 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 an aluminum octahedron. Oh, that's what we go gardening. This is why it all is possible, okay? If it wasn't for this, there'd be a lot of sharks, but there'd be no microorganisms living in terrestrial organisms, okay? This is it. And so these can share oxygens, and they make the silica, there's the silica tetrahedron sharing an oxygen with the aluminum octahedron there. And so, and here's this, and this is the silica tetrahedral sheet, the aluminum octahedral sheet, and the silica tetrahedral sheet. Here's the growing edge of the crystal. That gets bigger, a little bit of silk comes in, adds on, gets so big, breaks it, 0 0.002 millimeters. Here's a layer, another, 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 and there's millions of them, right? In a thimble full, we get a football field surface area. So giant surface area. Look at these interstitial spaces where water and nutrients can move out of, because that's shrinking and swelling. You know how you see clay, when it dries, it shrinks and it cracks. When it swells, that's because these, these layers are sucking up water and they're compressing when they dry. Okay? As it turns out, depending on the types of rocks that are dissolving or the types of organic matter that's decomposing, especially rocks, so there's some rocks, like dark rocks like we have around here, have more iron in them, and they also have more magnesium in them. And as it turns out, iron has almost the same size and almost the same charge to make a this to fit into this tetrahedron. And the and magnesium has almost the same size and almost the same charge to replace the aluminum in the aluminum tetrahedron. And I was like, what is this? Hold on. Here it is. Okay? So when that happens, where there's darker rocks, there's more of these substitutions into the crystalline lattice work that don't satisfy all the charges in the crystal. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. That's why you're here. <laughs> and because look, here's the silicon tetrahedral sheet, the aluminum octahedral sheet, and the silicon tetrahedral sheet. And if there's substitution of iron at the time of recrystallization, a net negative charge is propagated on the surfaces. 
Okay? Giant surface area with negative charge. Sand doesn't have a negative charge. Silt doesn't have a negative charge. Secondary mineral called clay has a giant surface area, a small particle, and has negative charges on it if there's isomorphic substitution in into the crystal modular. <laughs> Same thing happens in the octahedral sheet with magnesium. And now look at all these charges. And what those net negative charges, those, that's electrostatic charge. You know what a static charge is, right? When you rub a balloon and it sticks to the wall. It's because it's positive and negative and it's kind of sticking. It's not, it's not covalent bond. It's just kind of negative and positive that stick together. And so these negative charges, you know what sticks to negatively charged things? Positively charged things. And positively charged, and most of your mineral nutrients, like your calcium, your phosphorus, your potassium, your, all those things are a, a positive charge. And so when you put fertilizer on your soil, if it's organic fertilizer, it's just a special kind of organic matter that gets decomposed, but it releases phosphorus or, 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 um, or potassium or calcium, which gets stuck there temporarily. And that's, how, that's what soil fertility is, is the ability to store mineral nutrients from, from fertilizer or decomposed organic matter, wherever the nutrients are coming from, they have a positive charge and they get stuck to the native exchange complex on clay. And so that's why clay is good. Not only does it store water, but it stores nutrients, okay? And some clays store more and some less. And, um, and when you get a soil test, there's a number called the CEC number, the cation exchange capacity number. And that number, the higher it is, the more you can store nutrients. And mollusols have a higher number than erythosols do, right? And that's why a land costs money, is because if it can produce more food, it has more value. And it's cheaper to buy land in Christmas Valley than it is in the Lamb Valley. It just is. And that's why. You have you schmoo, right? Views are for suckers. Land <laughs> is all about land. All right, so look at this. Look, there's clay at 100,000 times magnification. It's not a ground down piece of rock. It's built up atom by atom, dissolved from rocks. Look at the layers. And it can only get to 0 0.002 millimeters. And it's got net negative charges all over it due to isomorphic substitution in the second layer called clay. Look at that clay. Net negative charge. Look at this clay. Net negative charge. Net negative charge due to isomorphic substitution in the second layer called clay. Look at that negative charge. Look at that surface area, right? And, and positively charged nutrients are stuck to it temporarily. And that is, that's why there's macroorganisms on the terrestrial ecosystems. Because if it wasn't, there wouldn't be enough stored calcium to ever make a skeleton the size that's in you. How would you get it? How would you have enough concentration in one area to ever make a plant that has enough that you could eat it, that you could make this? Otherwise, it would just all be out in the ocean. Complete dissolution. So this is how nutrients are stored on clay surfaces. Net negative charge. We're going to get it ready. Net negative charge due to isomorphic substitution on the secondary mineral called clay is the reason you're alive. It's the reason you garden. It's the reason you're going to eat tonight or this afternoon. And all that because every nutrient in your body was once stored in the negative exchange complex of clay and organic matter, which we've got to get later. There's calcium. Look, potassium, phosphorus, calcium. Store that when you put cal when you put your fertilizer on. What you're doing is you're storing it on the negative exchange complex of clay and organic. I keep saying like you know like so. There's one other thing in soil <laughs> that has twice the cation exchange capacity of the best clay. Guess what that is? Organic matter. What's the answer? Organic yeah. matter. Yeah. Otherwise, the other, only other solution is to steal land. Hello? <laughs> well, I'm going to go around. <laughs> and steal labor. That's been done too. As we know. So the answer is organic matter. Right? Because you can grow it. And when you, it has more negative charge than the best clay. You can't transport clay. From whose dead cold hands are you going to take it? No one. Right? 
mean, because you can take it from someone else, their fertility? No. But you can grow fertility. And that's what organic matter does. And here, I'll show it to you. Okay, you can also do all this stuff. Here it is. Organic is a random molecule. Like this was in a monkey's paw here. And this is from some tree that no longer exists or whatever. It's just a random molecule from leftover, all the decomposed product. And because it's a random molecule, it doesn't reflect back any particular spectrum in the electromagnetic spectrum, so it's dark. Right? Because it's a random color, right? And that, right? And so it's absorbed and actually absorbs energy from the sun in the form of heat. And dark cells heat up faster. And what's it all about? Temperature. And it's got net negative charges all over it. Like Pure humus has 200, like a good soil has a, a CEC number between 20 and 30. You might be saying 20 and 30, what? 20 times 6 trillion trillion, 20 times 6 trillion trillion negative charges per kilogram of dry soil. That's what that number is. They just lop off the 6 trillion trillion because they want to say it every time. Right? And that's what that number is. So you look up your, on your soil test, what is your CEC number? And if it's below 20, what's the answer? Right? Because you can increase that. And, and usually that's probably because it's a sandy soil. Right? Sandier soils have low CEC. Clay soils, are free. if you have a really high CEC, it's probably because you have a lot of clay and it gives you a lot of problems because it doesn't drain. You know what the answer is? Yeah, because when you add organic matter, it gets in between the clay and makes it more friable and over time and it drains better. Clay soils drain better with more organic So it's this high surface uh, molecule of net negative charges all over it. Here's a plant, eats the atmosphere, fills the tissues. Look at it. large form, medium form, small form, right? And liquid mineral nutrients get pulled in. They 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 take in they 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 evaporate their leaves, so they pull in water at their roots, which nutrients come along for the ride. But right here is something you might not know. Plants breathe for the same reason you do. They breathe oxygen at their roots to respirate, and they exhale CO2 just like you do, right? To do work, to create energy, to use energy in their bodies. And this is like a really important thing here. Who ever, who ever, ever drowned a plant? Unless you all, if you're not drowning plants, you're not trying hard enough. <laughs> and most people overwater everything all the time. So stop over, stop overwatering, number one, and stop disturbing your soil so much, and leave some weeds, and don't worry about it, because people grow stuff professionally. So and anyway, like me, um, I don't get paid. The students do though. Um, so here it is. Check it out. Here's a plant. Root, look at zooming in on the root hair. Here's the smallest root hair you never saw because it's so small. And it's in a small pore. So, what's in the small pores? Water, water. right? Mm -hmm. So, the small thing goes in because it wants to be where there's liquid water. Look, there's soil. Yeah. Look at it, there's a negative charge on it due to isomeric substitution and or organic matter coatings on sand. Like, you can coat the particles of sand with black stuff. You weld them together now, it's an exchange surface. Right? And look what's stuck to it. Nutrients. And as it turns out, some of these nutrients are more strongly absorbed than others because of their size or their number of charges. The smaller they are, the closer they can get to the charge. So they're stuck tighter. If they're big, they're kind of like kind of hanging there like a balloon. Or if they have a plus two charge, they're stuck a little tighter. Or whatever. It's called a lyotropic series. <laughs> and so you learn that all these are stuck at, at different amounts and st stuck there in this. <laughs> That's not in the class. Um, but CO2, they exhale CO2 at their root hairs. And when that happens, CO2 dissolves in water. You know that. You ever open a can of soda and the bubbles come out? Right? That's because there was CO2 at one pressure dissolved in there. And when CO2, and you might notice that, like, like sparkling water, it kind of tastes a little lemony, right? It's got a little bite to it. Because CO2, when it dissolves in water, forms carbonic acid, which far, further dissociates into carbon, car, carbonate ion, but it releases hydrogen ion, which is what acidity is. The number of hydrogen ions in solution is the pH of the soil. And so the more hydrogen ions there are, the lower the pH is, right? As it turns out, 
hydrogen ion is the most strongly absorbed of all the ions because it's so small. It doesn't have a large charge, but it's really small, so it can get really tight. And so what does it do? It says, calcium, you're out. I'm in. So these two hydrogens take the place of these two charges and these two charges, and this thing floats out and gets sucked in, and that's how it gets into a plant. And then you eat it, or your mom ate it, or you ate an animal and ate it, and that's how you get a skeleton. That's how the nutrients come up. And that happens when the plant is respirating more. When does that happen? In the summer when things are warmer, because it allows the thermodynamics. And so in the summer, there's, there's pumping out CO2 at the roots, and that's why you need to water got to have, that has to be water between these two things to happen. And so that goes in this, into solution, which becomes hydrogen ion, which removes the nutrients. And all these nutrients that you store there against the, the, the electrostatically, you store them. And that's why you put the fertilizer on in the first place in the proportions that you want to grow the thing you want. And now it's all just sitting there. And as the plant grows, it exploits more of the soil habitat. And then it takes it up. As it even the bigger the plant gets, the warmer it gets up starting to make fruit. Now it's got fibrous roots into every nook and cranny and it's pulling it out. And that's how the nutrients get, where they come from, how they're stored, and how plants get them off. Yeah? Yeah. I'll show you one last slide. Look at this. Look, there's all the mineral nutrients. Look, they do things in plants. Like, you gotta have iron, it acts as an oxygen carrier, right? Just like it does in your blood. Hemoglobin. Um, it's really important, like, you know, quickens maturity, sulfur does, you know, fruit flavor, copper, super important. These are all things that have that, you know, that, and, and then you eat that and they do the, those things in you. And then we all die. <laughs> and then it goes around, as it has done for millions of times already. I mean, one last little demo. Look, uh, yeah, here. All right, all right. This was once a tree, right? This is carbon from the atmosphere and energy of the sun. If I get 451 degrees, it burns. That is oxidation. That, that's the energy of the sun from the time when this plant photosynthesized this. And you'll notice that the wood is sort of going away Right? Like in complete combustion, you know, a piece of paper just goes away. Where is it going? Back to CO2, water, vapor, and heat. Same thing happens biologically, like in your gut right now. You eat food and it burns at a lower temperature, 97 degrees as it turns out, because the bugs in your gut lower the activation energy necessary for that exact same chemistry to happen. Just happens at 97 degrees instead of 451 degrees. Because <coughs> enzymes do that. They're little chemicals that say, oh, you can do this at a lower temperature. Try it. And then it burns. And what comes off of that? CO2, water, vapor, and heat. Oxygen in, CO2, water, vapor, and heat out. We're ready to get oxygen in, <laughs> CO2, water, vapor, and heat out. How do you keep that fire going? You add fuel. And where does the fuel come from? It comes from the atmosphere and the sun and the soil. And what's left over in the fireplace after it's all over? Carbon. Ash, not carbon. Carbon goes back to CO2. Yeah. What's ash? All the other elements. The mineral nutrients, right? And instead of that little bit of ash, goes and builds your bones and builds re build your cells, and that's why you're here. Then you slough that stuff off, right? See that? What comes out of the tailpipe of your internal combustion engine car if you're driving one of those? CO2, water, vapor, heat, and ash. So it's, that's what gasoline is. It's old photosynthetic production, right? And then heats up the air, pushes the piston down, makes the crank go around, right? Because it's heat energy from the sun at the time of photosynthesis. Yeah, what comes out of a compost ball? Why does the compost ball get smaller? It's going back to CO2, water, vapor, heat, and what's left in higher concentration later? Ash, mineral nutrients. So you put a big pile of compost as big and it gets about one third of this. And now it's got all the ash that was in there is concentrated into something this, that's not really, don't think of it as fertilizer, but it is fertilizer, right? That's about it.
Can we look at somebody's soil? Yeah. Yeah. Can we do that? I don't know. Probably gonna go. Can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. Um, when you test your soil, do you just test where you're actually gardening? Great or, question. Or do you and test a couple different spaces? I mean, of course, you need practical information. I'm sorry, this is not exactly <laughs> <right. laughs> um, But the, the secret is, like, if this is your garden, say this is the side of your garden. You want to take a random yet representative sample. If you truly put a random number of generator out there, you might get all the corners and the edges. But that could happen. So you don't want to do that. But you don't want to do right down the middle. Because maybe you drag, somebody like was dragging fertilizer around your farm one time and they had a big lion and they didn't tell you because they didn't want to tell you that they were wasting a bag of fertilizer. And then you're saying, but that I don't think you're going to get it. So you want to, wherever it looks a little different, like it's a different, it feels different, it's probably different. You should sample that differently. So in a garden like this size, you probably want to get 10 samples, it would not hurt. You just go down about that deep with a shovel, put it in a bucket, mix it up super good, send it to the lab. I just sent ours into the lab yeah, today, this morning, from 10 sites at Oak Creek Center. And, um, and we'll get those results back, and I can show you what a, what a soil test looks like. I have to have one in my last slide here. Here's one. Um, so here, as you can see, this is from a and Labs. It's in Modesto, this place have to have this report, but there's one in uh, St. Louis. And you should always use a local lab if you can, because they're making assumptions about the climate and the types of rocks. So how the soil sample work? They take the soil sample, they, they dry it, they grind it, and then they weigh out some of it, they get a weight, and then they put it in a 600 degree oven and burn off all the organic matter and weigh it again. Now it weighs less, and they can calculate the percent organic matter from that. And this soil has 2.7% organic matter. Then they take that mineral soil and they say, huh, what's it? well, this is Corvallis, we know how much it rains here, this is the average temperature, pretty typical, the weathering rates are about like this. Meaning the rocks are dissolving at a certain rate and they make an assumption about that based on experiments that have been done here in Oregon State for years. 100 years. And they say, well, if we put this much strong acid on it, we can get that amount to weather away in 10 minutes. And then we can measure how much it is. So they can predict how much, what strength acid they need to subject the soil to, essentially, to simulate 10 weeks of weathering in your garden. So they do it really fast, and then they send it back to you as data. And you can see this one has a lot of magnesium, a lot of manganese, a lot of iron, a lot of copper. This is kind of high, medium, and low. Pretty low in phosphorus, pretty low in calcium and sodium. So, you know, this is what you need to be like thinking about for fertility. And some are, and, and in organic farming, all the, almost all of the fertilizers you buy are just special kinds of organic matter. Like flaxseed meal, you know, alfalfa meal, fish meal, blood meal, chicken manure kelp meal, right? And they just have different amounts of potassium and some of so you add those on accordingly. And the bugs eat them and release them and make them available. Um, the pH is pretty low, right? You want this to be about 6.5 or something typically. Um, here's the CC, pretty low, 15. Be nice if it was 20. What's the answer? Okay. Yeah, again, there, right? <laughs> and then it kind of tells you and they'll give you comments. Because you're doing this as, let's see, somewhere here it says garden, or organic vegetables. So you tell them, this is what I'm saying, with, I'm doing a garden. And so you'll take that sample and then you send it and they'll say, oh, nitrogen release is some oh, blood meal, see, blood meal, not see meal, hoof and horn meal. Wow. <laughs> awesome. Sodium nitrate, not recommended, right? Because this is organic, um, et cetera, right? And so that's why you want to have a soil test. Um, and we'll just look at one person's soil, we'll call it. James, what's the best way to get the soil test? I mean, you mentioned a place in Salem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, A&L. A&L. They're good. Okay. I like them. We have one at Oregon State University, too, but it's mostly for science stuff. And maybe the report's hard to read. Is it kind of expensive? Huh? Is it kind of expensive? Eh, that's probably 40, 50 bucks. But man, I mean, you're spending, it, it, it was the best money you spent. Okay. Yeah, we were 40, 50 
dollars for each sample of water. Well, it's just you, you make a little composite together. sample oh, okay. and you send one. That's why you're taking a random yeah. sample, okay. mixing it, sending okay. multiple composites. But you just want to make sure you're not yeah. diluting yeah. it with mm -hmm. two different soils or something. You know? um, and you know, if you're garden, if you're doing raised bed gardening, if it's all organic matter, it's a different sample. It's a different. You're, you're, you're more than your. You should sample it. You should send it in its compost. But they might be able to just call them up. So I got the raised beds. My half of it's organic. Man, what should I do? They'll have an answer. Mm -hmm. So pretty close to here. Yep. Is that yeah. Willow Boulevard or something? Uh, between West Hills and then, uh, yeah, Highway 20. Oh, yeah, good one there. Old Filbert Orchard. Yeah, right? This is probably all along Orchard. It was. Uh, was it here too? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, the, the image is not coming up, it doesn't matter. So it's some, you know, this is a soil type, right? So if we click on it, it's Woodburn, mostly. And you can see it's 92% wood burn, 5% amity, 2% date, and what we say, Huberly. That just means if if we were like just randomly throw a lawn dart out into there, there would be a 92% chance of it being wood burn. There's some other salts in there too, the low lying areas or something like that. But let's just look at wood burn, and this will be kind of instructive. Um, and this is the thing that's on your phone too. Soil web, and and um, and here is the soil. But right down here, oh look at this! This is the total plant available water is 44. What that means is, if I took a cube, a cube of that soil undisturbed, and remember it, we, it's about 50 percent porosity. And we don't know the size distribution of the pores, but if I were to soak that in water and get 100 percent of the pores filled with water. The, the volumetric water content at saturation would equal the percent porosity, which would be 50%. So if I fill all the pores, the volumetric water content would be 50%. If I lift it out and let it drain, some of the pores would drain, but 44% would be left with water. So, that, so well, it's a, it has a lot of water it's holding, I guess, of course, because mm -hmm. it's pretty fine texture. But, but it could have big holes in it and stuff and drain faster, but still, so that, and that number is super important. Sandy soils is really low. Clayey soils is really low. You know why? Because the, the, the clay is so small, the pores are, that the water is held so tightly that the plants can't do it because it's just sucked in there. So a large percent of it can be held in the clay size pores so tightly that plants can't get at it. And the more they try, they wilt. Because it, it's like they're sucking in. They, <laughs> right? It's sucked in. <clears throat> and there's only so much pressure <coughs> differential that a plant can take before it falls over. Mm -hmm. so that's why a loam is good. And this is a, <coughs> it's, it's pretty hot. But that's an available range. Because the stuff that drains out is not available. And the stuff that's held too tight is not available. 44% by volume is storing water in the available pressure range of plants. <coughs> good soil. Look at the native plants that are associated with that soil. They just the same but adapted to these soil conditions. And anything in blue, you can click on it. All these plants, you can click on them. Mm -hmm. And if you go down here, look at, here's the percent organic matter at the surface, and then it goes down as you go down deeper. Mm -hmm. So at the surface, it's almost 4% organic matter. Now this is under, you know, ideal conditions. And look at the percent clay, it's somewhere between 15 and 30, so it's like 20. And it bumps up when you get down to, you know, like 25 centimeters mm -hmm. or something. And then it drops off. And that's because these are different flood events. You can mm -hmm. see that there's something going on here to 1976. Mm -hmm. Now look at the percent sand. It's not very sandy at all. So it's got, let's just say it's got 20% clay and 10% sand. So that's 30, but the rest is silt. So it's a very silty, it's called silt loam. It has a, a little bit of each, but it's got more silt, so it's called a silt. And here's the pH, you know, 5.7.6.2, unamended. Um, here's the rate at which water goes in, like if you undisturbed. It goes in at 28 millimeters per hour, which is about an inch and a half. So it can take an inch and a half of, of rain or irrigation. Um, no salts. These are all salts. Where are the salts? They're in the ocean. 
because it rains enough here that it goes down into the water table and plays. Right? And here is the CEC. And you'll see the CEC is like, oh, it's like 20 or something like that. And it kind of goes up right here. Why? Because the clay goes up there. And the organic matter is pretty high here, so it's pretty high generally up here. But and there's a bunch of clays here, probably there's all clay, and then it kind of drops off there because it gets the sandy part. See the sand goes up there, right? Man, we learned a lot. Huh? Right, perfectly right. Yeah. Yeah. So man, we learned a lot today. Well, does that mean they sample? I mean, yeah, great, great question. They go out and sample every cubic centimeter or so on the planet. No. <laughs> <laughs> what they do is, a hundred years ago. They looked at maps of topography, they looked at maps of geology, they looked at maps of vegetation, they looked at weather maps, they, and they said, wow, there's probably going to be this kind of soil here because we know how soil is formed. And they drew lines on aerial photos, and then they went out and checked it. And the higher the value of the land, the more well checked it is. <laughs> so the agricultural lands are quite accurate. You, you know, you get out to Christmas and it's all just soil. But, you know, so it, 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 and to soil or something like that. And, um, but what they do is they dig a hole and they actually, yeah, they go and they take samples and they send them into the lab and they do all this, so much more data here than you've ever seen. And they've done that and there's 20,000 different names for this. And they've been working on that for 100 years. And I'm past president of Oregon Society of Soil Scientists, I've done that three times. And I, you know, I started 20 years ago with them. And 20 years ago, I was like half of them were the old mappers. And they're all dying and they're awesome. Because they don't like people. <laughs> <laughs> and they go to map millions of acres, literally. They get million acre mappers and stuff where they can map and they all know each other and they all and a lot of them advance up in the NRCS and become managers and stuff. And I talked to some of my favorite people who are so like three of them left. Um I said, Why didn't you advance? You know, why did you not? We're the losers. <laughs> I just wanted to map soil. I didn't want to like manage people. <laughs> <laughs> Why is this such a good area for, for grass? And it's because it has this kind of soil. And you don't have to irrigate, mm -hmm. right? Because it has 44% of volumetric water content it's got available water. Mm -hmm. And up in the slopes, that's why it's good for wine, because it drains and it gets dry and the plants stress and they make better grapes because they're trying to get out of there. <laughs> right? They're trying to make a delicious thing that a bird will eat and shut the seed out down here. <laughs> so the grape could do what it wanted to. It would live down here and just be a giant vine with leaves as big and never make grapes. <laughs> so under some stress, generally speaking, that's why we grow them in rows and prune the shit out of them and all that stuff, is to try and stress them out so they, they will make better things. Because that's how they survive catastrophes in the past. And the ones that didn't do that, didn't survive the catastrophe in the past. So, so fruit is generally sort of a response to stress. It's a real problem. People don't want to have kids anymore because they don't not stressed out. <laughs> you need more stress. Better question. Yeah, well, I was kind of curious about that phrase, monitor the BRICS level in the soil report. What was it? The monitor the BRICS level. Oh, yeah, I wasn't sure what that was. I mean, that sounds like sugar to me. I know. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I saw that. I just kind of skipped over it real quick because I had no idea what they were talking about. Let's see, where did it say that? The second line on the Monitor BRICS end. levels. I mean, so is that something you could do at home? I mean, I don't know. Could you have a little BRICS meeting? <laughs> <laughs> no, but your question, you know, to follow that, I don't okay. know why you would monitor BRICS levels. But maybe they. Maybe in your 